Good evening. I'm Milton Curry, Dean of the School of Architecture at USC and the Della and Harry McDonald Dean's Chair in Architecture. And I want to welcome everyone to our Architecture Engaged uh, Lecture Series. Uh, I want to thank Professor and Graduate Architecture Program Director Alvin Wang and the Public Events Committee, our communications team for helping to put our put this event together. Keiko McNally, Assistant Dean, Cynthia Pena, Events Coordinator, and Fern Vargas, Graphic Designer. I also want to state that we will be having a Q&A following the speaker's remarks this evening. And if you'll put your questions into the Q&A function um, or the chat, that would, be, that would be great. So we can include you in the conversation this evening. Gary Hindell, fellow of the American Institute of Architects, is the founder and managing principal, uh, managing partner of Handel Architects. Since starting the practice in 1994, Gary has overseen its, its growth to a firm of now over 200 architects, designers, and planners around the world. His designs and the firm's designs have been recognized by the American Institute of Architects, the Urban Land Institute, the Society of Registered Architects in the Chicago Anthenaeum, among others. Gary also makes significant pro bono contributions to local urbanism, including supporting nonprofits and community serving institutions in the cities in which his firm works. He serves as founding member of the, the Friends of the High Line in New York City, as well as a member of the executive committee of the board of the Lower East Side Tenement Museum, which tells the story of immigration in America. Gary is a graduate of Cornell uh, the Cornell School of Architecture, uh, where he graduated with the Bachelor of Architecture in 1978. Um, and it's in uh, the go-go years of the 1980s that uh, we crossed paths as he was instrumental in uh, uh, providing me an opportunity to, to work at Cone Pedersen Fox in New York. And um, there, I believe, uh, was a genesis of uh, various kinds of thinking and activities that Gary's engaged in um, today. Um, First, some personal notes, and then, and then I'm going to um, talk a little bit about his practice and where, where that sits today. Um, I think one of the things that, that I've always appreciated about Gary uh, as a leader in the discipline uh, with such a large firm is his commitment to uh, design excellence and running an inclusive uh, architecture and design practice um, and seeing excellence and diversity as being sutured together, uh, not separate. And I think that kind of personal accountability uh, is what uh, we need even more of in the in the discipline, and Gary has shown that in uh, his work with nonprofits, uh, as we mentioned, the High Line, uh, as well as the Tenement Museum, and closer to home, of no affiliation to USC, he's been one of the early uh, contributors, multi-year contributors, and investors to the A Lab uh, Architecture Development Program for high school students, based on our campus at USC within the School of Architecture, an innovative program. Uh, that Gary um, supported uh, from the moment that we asked him to do so. And, and we're grateful uh, for that, as are the students who are benefiting from that investment. Also, um, I hope, Gary, you'll speak a little bit about this of how the ethos of, of the practice has evolved, um, the kinds of activities that are happening within the office, the kind of um, conversations that are spawned by kind of um, the office being a catalyst for um, groups within the office to discuss contemporary issues and how that actually feeds back into the work itself, because I think that um, is something that students particularly would be very interested in. As a large practice, and we often think of these practices as maybe corporate practices, um, but I think it's, it's much more um, nuanced than that when we look at practices like uh, Handel Architects. Um, the iterative design process and the ethos that goes into the work um, relative to the scale that, that one is working at allows for innovation and experimentation um, to itself be an iterative process. And I think in the projects that, that I've appreciated over the years uh, uh, from Handel Architects, it's that ability to, to learn from large scale work, uh, to bring that into smaller scale work, um, to think about climate and um, uh, community in, in very interesting, intriguing ways and projects might lend themselves to that. And then bringing that ethos into other projects that where it may be uh, much fresher, represent a much fresher approach. 
And um, I know that Gary will, he's got um, uh, the benefit of riches of, of, of hundreds of projects to be able to talk about, which is amazing uh, that, that the firm is, is as prolific as it is in all uh, categories of, of architecture and all typologies. Um, but um, so you'll get a glimpse of that. But I just want to um, call out a few projects that I think um, are evidence of, of what I'm describing. Uh, when you look at the student residences at the University of Toronto in Scarborough or the Essex at Essex Crossing in New York, um, you see um, ethos around public space and community that I think is, is embedded within those projects in a way that's very interesting and very fresh and very contemporary. Um, the, the house at Cornell Tech um, in uh, Roosevelt Island in New York uh, is the largest and tallest residential building in the world built to passive house standards. Uh, very innovative. Um, and you might think that's a, um, an institutional building uh, but then uh, Sendero Verde, which is uh, not an institutional um, building, is uh, a residence, uh, a affordable housing, 709 affordable housing units uh, in Harlem, I believe. Um, this is a project which has extensive community space, retail space, outdoor gardens, a school uh, will be operating the space as well as supported programming supported by Union Settlement, which is one of the oldest settlement houses in New York City. Um, so these are very intriguing um, projects that are, um, again, um, with the vertical integration of the typologies that are occurring uh, within the constellation of the firm itself, there's able, you're able to kind of have learnings that are crossing and transferring to different teams. I think that's very exciting about um, having a large firm. That project that I just mentioned is also, uh, I don't know if it's done, but it will be the Passive House certified, uh, will be Passive House certified, making it the largest fully affordable passive house building in the world when it's completed. So just really an amazing um, variety of projects. And then I'll point to another area that you might not think about um, when you think of Handel Architects, but they've been very um, interested in um, the idea of memory and memorial, um, starting with um, the national uh, September 11th Memorial, which was done uh, out of Handel Architects. And also more recently, the Emanuel Nine Memorial um, that that memorializes uh, a more recent um, tragedy um, in the South. So these are some very interesting projects as well. I, I hope to get into the Q&A if, if some of these are not um, in the presentation itself. But um, with that said, um, I, it's a pleasure to welcome Gary um, to this audience at USC. And um, please join me in welcoming him. And uh, we look forward to your lecture, Gary. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Curry, for that most generous um, introduction. That they, um, and so Jonathan, if you could start to share. Jonathan? Great. Um, my relationship with USC and Milton has been something that I've um, become very fond of. Milton has been a friend of mine for um, quite a number of decades at this point in time and watching him and his career in terms of really um, you know, expanding the definitions of what it means to teach at an architecture school and what we should be learning has been inspiring to me and has a lot to do with some of the things that you'll see in this lecture. So go next. And so as, as Milton mentioned, we're in our 28th year, we're over 200 folks around the world. Um, we've had a tremendous um, run. Um, it's been incredibly exciting um, to be um, helming this firm, and we've been able to create over 60 million square feet of projects um, around the world and set up offices in New York, Boston, San Francisco, and Hong Kong, and go next. Um, and as Milton mentioned, and to partner with organizations that I love to help found Friends of the High Line uh, to steer the capital campaigns and, the, and sort of run the building stock for the Tenement Museum, which talks about um, what it means to become an American is expanding that definition um, to not only talk about people who immigrated here, but people who were forcibly patriated um, to this country, and then um, to um, also start a new nonprofit for Plus Pool, which has very ambitious social and environmental goals, and go next. 
Uh, we are fortunate to be able to work around the world. This is a little bit of our work distribution. And it's amazing to be able to see how different places and different cultures approach um, problems and how they uh, look at building and what um, buildings mean in their society. And uh, those travels and those construction projects around the world have also opened up my ideas to a world, my eyes to a world of difference. And go next. Um, as Milton mentioned, um, we uh, we um, are involved in the creation of, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the works of it, Italo Calvino and what memory means to a city. And so these memorials really are the repository of, of memories of, of, of sometimes horrific and tragic events. So I'm working with my partner, Michael Rod, to bring the September 11th memorial into into reality was one of the emotional highlights of my career and go next. And that work has continued um, on um, to commemorate um, really the love that the, um, the, you know, the, the, the uh, you know, that comes out of Mother Emanuel Church and the forgiveness in the face of unspeakable tra tra you know, tragedy um, in commemorating the Emanuel Nine in Charleston, South Carolina and go next. Um, uh, the renovation of Pier 57 um, for Google in the Hudson River. Um, we're very involved in keeping what we consider beautiful buildings um, alive and bringing them into new uses. And go next, including the Dream. Go next, including the Dream Hotel, um, which was transformed from the Siemens Institute um, into um, this hotel down on 18th Street um, in the village. And go next. Um, over 150 residential buildings around uh, the world, all, all trying to find an appropriate way to integrate into their neighborhoods, including um, this one at Enclave at the cathedral. So that's adjacent to the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. And you can see how the structural system of the building um, takes the form of these uh, buttresses, which almost form a vertical landscape that's um, evocative of the Gothic buttresses of the cathedral um, and create a building that um, doesn't look like any other residential building, but uh, pays homage to um, to the cathedral that it sits next to and next. All right, can you go to full screen mode? Uh, Jonathan, that would be you. Maybe not. Maybe not. It's okay. But... Okay, we'll keep we'll keep moving. Okay. Um, you and Jonathan will work on that. Um, the um, and then the Pacific, which is the um, actually the conversion of a eleven story medical office building into a residential in San Francisco. And next, uh, Seraph and the Lion Hotel at nine fifty Market, one of our mixed use buildings in San Francisco. And go next. 10,000 Santa Monica, one of the most successful rental buildings in Los Angeles, and go next. And then working with Don Peebles um, on the project for Angels Landing um, in LA as well, a big mixed use building with uh, almost 500 apartments, cultural facilities, two hotels, um, and a bunch of retail, and go next. Um, working on a number of some incredibly exciting uh, buildings that are ex exploring the limits of sustainability in Santiago, Chile, um, buildings that really take advantage of the moderate climate down there, which is very similar um, to the climate of San Diego and Los Angeles, um, to basically try to eliminate um, almost all of the mechanical systems um, from um, large scale office buildings and go next. Um, and projects um, in Abu Dhabi and the Emirates, um, and this one, uh, Rosewood Hotel and Residences, and go next. So all in all, you know, um, as Milton mentioned, lots of work, 270 projects, 60 million square feet, over 50,000 homes, over 5,000 hotel rooms, 18 million square feet of office, lots of awards and lots of publications, but go next, that's not why, um, we do what we do, you know, and it really is. Um, I've spent the last 20 years next trying to figure out um, 
really what the impact of buildings is. So not just, you know, to have them not just be things, you know, that are well-made and functional, providing shelter and accommodating our basic needs, and not only beautiful with the potential to inspire us and uplift the human spirit, but they actually are not just things in themselves, but in action. And as you were all taught by your parents, actions have consequences and go next. And so it's trying to understand the consequences of building and what a building can do and how it can actually change things has occupied me and been my passion um, for the last 20 years and go next. And so it comes down to the project of the, you know, of the city, you know, which is really, and this is, you know, this is our core, our core statement, you know, it really is our mission, which that we believe in the creation of culturally rich, diverse, sustainable cities is the best way to ensure the highest standard of living for the greatest number of the world's inhabitants while putting the least amount of strain on the planet's resources. So that's, that's our, that's what we believe. That's what we try to le live every day, every one of those words. I also believe that the city is mankind's greatest work of art, and it actually is the built form of our society and represents you know, who we are as a people and go next. It's also our best hope for a sustainable future. Um, you know, folks in cities use half the carbon of folks in the ex-urban environment and carless urban people use um, less than a quarter of that, you know, generate less than a quarter of that carbon. Um, go next. It's where our prosperity comes from. On 3% of the land, we generate 90% of the GDP and generate 86.2% of the jobs um, in, this, you know, in this country. And then go next. And it's also where we meet people who might have backgrounds that are different from us, you know, that where we actually might experience, you know, you know especially in America, people who come from different places who make who are part of this amalgam of folks that form that form our country that's celebrated in the you know in the tenement museum and go next and then you know and then i love this quote from michelle obama i've learned that it's harder to heat up close you know so basically this is you know cities are, are really where we um, get rid of the concept of otherness and go next and so the 20 years have been focused on just trying to think of how can we make better cities to make a better world. And then, um, and then this is also something that I believe in our context. I don't necessarily, it's the only way the world could have been organized, but in the world that I live in and work in, in a market economy, the best outcomes arise when enlightened self-interest is harnessed by intelligent public policy to create positive change. And architecture and design give form and shape to those initiatives and can inspire others um, to embrace those missions. And so it's it's that you know that we're you know that we're in, engaged in looking at places where um, design, politics, and money can be brought together in order to change the world. And go next. So these are our areas of of focus, you know, and so we, we have a whole group that's in, engaged in, and really everyone in the firm in, in process and technical innovations, urban environments, large scale demonstration projects, um, mixed use, multi-building interventions, um, all really geared to the idea of really creating multi-generational multi, multi generational mixed in communities and go next. And then on the process and progress side, um, again, you know, as Milton mentioned, the idea that every project is an opportunity for innov innovation and to push the world forward, to do something that hasn't been done before, and then to demonstrate to others that it's possible. Um, so um, these are just some of the things that you know that we're um, that we're involved in. And we'll go through um, you know a couple of them you know here, and then go next. You know, and so. One of the things that we're um, heavily involved in is really the creation of our own tools. You know that basically we believe that we are, you know, essentially digital craftsmen, 
and so that you know so in this case we um, have you know create we we hire um, uh, coding in you know interns mostly uh, recently out of the University of Cincinnati but out of any other program that produces um, good computer science people who are interested in architecture um, and we've invented hacks that can actually take any of our models into virtual reality and go next we um, we have a whole group focused on um, computational design, which is really helping us generate and measure data from the analysis of a wide range of alternative solutions to see if we can understand um, better ways to do things and evolve better, um, better solutions. And so it's really about how those projects are set up and problems are set up and go next. You know, and basically using um, all sorts of different tools and starting to um, engage in machine learning to um, actually hook up with Grasshopper and Revit um, in order to generate um, both data um, and solutions. And go next. And this was a, a sample project um, in DC um, where we tried to use all of those tools to basically generate solutions with data um, to help us measure um, um, the amount of sunlight, the amount of, of views. Um, you know, and the uh, qualities of green space, which was somewhat subjective um, on a fairly dense um, site in, in Washington, DC. And go next. And then on a slightly, maybe more important, but slightly more prosaic, um, 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 uh, you know, project is really the creation of the, what we call the Airtable, um, which is a database that we use to track and verify the sustainability characteristics of everything that goes into our projects with, um, with you know, nearly 60 different criteria. So this is really like um, a red list on steroids, you know, and so basically one of our clients is tremendously interested in this research. Um, and so um, we have a team dedicated to working with manufacturers for them to deliver test data um, to demonstrate um, how each of their projects perform on things like carbon generation, life cycle, um, you know, um, carbon usage, usage, recyclability, um, VOC generation, not just for the build, for the materials themselves, but for their manufacture. Um, the goal is to get this um, to do this work and then push it out into the world. And go next. And then there's uh, a whole bunch of of work, which is maybe the core of of our practice, which is really multi-building um, mixed-use urban interventions around around the world, um, you know, on, there, we probably have worked on over forty of these, um, including our uh, initial projects around Lincoln Square in in New York City. Um, and go next. Um, and because we love cities, we love the impact that these buildings can have on cities. If you look at the slide on the lower left, you know, basically a standard building you know, is what we call a monoculture. And then if we can, we, you know, we have the belief that if we can um, bring enough of these uses together in a vertically integrated mixed use building, we can actually create an ecosystem, um, you know, and that basically that, that that building will have a more profound impact on its urban environment than a single use building. Um, We've explored the concept of periodicity, which is the you're know, trying to generate data on how our buildings are used with the different uses over the diff over the course of the day to actually measure um, the number of pedestrians that come onto the street to utilize these different projects at different times. Go next. Um, you know, it, with the idea that these uses can actually combine synergistically, this is how we sell it to our clients, you know, which is that basically that by the combination of these uses, they actually work synergistically with each other, that the apartments benefit um, as they move up the building and views get better and they actually generate customers for the hotel office and other uses. Um, the, um, there are certain uses that are better closer to the ground and other uses that belong higher up um, in the building. And that by organizing them in the right way, we can actually get these synergies to um, happen and we can actually create economic value um, for, um, for our clients as well as um, urban value um, for, um, for cities and go next. Um, so we have evolved that into what we call a vertical economic 
ecology, um, which is really the idea of understanding um, where things should be in order to achieve their highest and best value. And go next. And then there is the idea then, you know, and then, so this is a sample project in Boston. Um, so this is um, Millennium Towers in Boston. It's a, a, a three building complex, two towers and a small purple thing that you can see down in the left. Um, so the uses compacted are what you see in that, um, you know, in that stacked uh, programmatic axon. And then on the right is how much land um, that would, um, would take up if they were um, spread out into um, individual pro programs um, you know, on, you know, in, in a more conventional way. Um, so we call this, you know, um, you know, we say it's density is its own re reward. We also call, you know, call it an urban mega vitamin and go next. And this is our first series of projects that we took, undertook in 1994 uh, and on Broadway between 60, uh, 6th and 68th Street. And so, um, and what it did was um, put uh, um, um, a couple of million square feet in a variety of programs onto these three sites um, flanking Broadway. And then we went back um, five years after the project was finished and did um, data surveys and traffic analysis <clears throat> for all of the uses. And we found out that on these sites, which had been largely vacant, uh, we were generating um, over 8 million um, pedestrian trips a year on this corridor of Broadway. This exists just to the north of Lincoln Center. And this stretch of Broadway between um, 66th and 72nd Street had really become a dead zone, um, mostly created by the urban renewal um, um, plans that were put into effect by Lincoln Center. Um, but when we did this project, um, in the, uh, which was incredibly successful for our clients, generating all of this population on the streets, um, seeing um, the, uh, the attention these buildings got, six uh, other developers did buildings um, um, on this stretch of Broadway and um, Amsterdam Avenue. Uh, we wound up doing three of them um, as well. And basically that corridor now is fully connecting um, 59th Street up to 72nd Street and go next. <clears throat> um, and then to Essex Crossing, um, which Milton mentioned, um, which has been taking these ideas into, uh, you know, um, an, you know an, an interesting direction. So you can see the sites in pink and red there. The red ones are the ones that we did next. These exist on Manhattan's Lower East Side. And go next. And so the Lower East Side in 1900 was the densest place on the planet with densities of over 1,100 people per, per acre. Um, it was the place of landing for most of the immigration, um, the, you know, coming into, you know, into into the into the U.S. And it was a vibrant, um, lively neighborhood, um, you know, home to generations of immigrants from all over the world. Um, go next. The city in its wisdom um, decided to embark on an urban renewal plan, otherwise known as slum clearance, um, to displace thousands of residents um, from a series of, of, you know, of blocks in the Lower East Side. Go next. These sites became a battleground politically for who would come back to these sites. And so these sites sat fallow for nearly 50 years in the heart of a still vibrant neighborhood, um, mostly due to the recalcitrance of one politician um, who was voted out of office after going through a political scandal, uh, which allowed the development of the sites to proceed. And what was interesting and going next was that the city and the developers embarked on a community driven approach to determine what would be built, uh, what type of housing would be built and who would live here. And one of the mo most amazing things about this was there was outreach to the families and descendants of the people who had been displaced from this neighborhood 
in the 1960s to give them first dib on the low income apartments when they came back. Astounding, you know, one of the most beautiful processes that I've been through. Um, so um, our projects, we had, so we did two projects and they're um, examples of, of mixed income housing. And so they're 50% market and 50% low income um, and uh, across two income bands, 60% uh, of AMI and 110% of AMI. And these AMIs were not chosen by the developer. They were chosen by the community. And this is not the only income bands that are, that are satisfied, but the income bands for the entire project were agreed upon on a multi-year negotiation with the community and community board who was given a proactive role in determining you know, the, the, the folks that would come back and go next. Um, and so the project has been labeled the anti-Hudson Yards um, for the openness of its process, its scale and its uh, richness and its integration into the fabric of the city and go next. And so you, here you can see um, the nine buildings that make up um, Essex Crossing. Um, and um, we're doing two of them, a, a whole series of other architects are working on others, um, uh, working in collaboration with um, the entire team has been a joy. You know, there are projects for low income seniors, uh, pure market rate buildings, uh, our mixed income you know, um, buildings, cultural facilities, you know, um, as well as a renovated building for the Essex Street Market and go next. And here you can see a photo montage of the, of the project and go next. And here um, our two buildings are on the periphery of this. There's a market rate condominium project in the middle. And one of the most difficult parts of this project was actually we're connecting these three buildings underneath city streets <clears throat> in order to create an urban market underground that can also connect. Um, you see the green area up there, that's the low line, which is the original trolley facilities that basically first um, created mass transit in New York, um, which a nonprofit is trying to bring back um, you know, as a bit of urban infrastructure a la the High Line and go next. And so here you can see the first um, of those buildings, the Essex um, in the upper left, the Essex Street Market and Market Line, um, you know, food related retail. Um, above that, uh, Regal Cinema uh, Multiplex. Um, to the bottom left, um, the uh, residential uh, green space amenities and an urban farm uh, connected by vertical circulation. Uh, um, the uh, units of housing above that in the upper right, and then how those buildings are um, composed into this rather complex puzzle you know, that basically activates the street, provides um, diverse housing opportunities, as well as entertainment and, and retail um, for everyone to come to and go next. Um, and uh, here a view of the project, you're looking um, at the light scoop on the left, um, an exploration of mega panel facades um, for, the, um, for the facade materials and go next. Uh, looking at what we call the light scoop and this and go next. Uh, and from the interior looking at the market, the market line and, uh, and, the, and S, the renovated Essex Street Market going down to the market line with those stairs, um, go, ne go next. Um, and then again, the, a view of the multi-level um, market space, uh, similar to Grand Central Market, you know, in, um, in, in LA, uh, urban farm um, on the main roof and go next uh, and next views of the apartments, which have amazing views, you know, um, to the bridges, to the river, um, to the south and to Midtown and go next. Second building, the artisan, its sister building, uh, go next. This one combining tech office, market line, uh, additional retail on uh, Broom Street Garden um, with apartments above, go next. Um, views of its um, facade, um, looking at the retail, um, the deck and the tower and go next. Views of the office entrance and go next. 
and then a series of large-scale demonstration projects, um, some of which Milton um, mentioned. Um, and these projects are undertaken to do something a little bit different and to show um, that they are possible to do these things and go next. And so uh, one of the areas of concentration is really demonstrating passive house at scale. Um, so the house at Cornell Tech, um, Sendero Verde, which we'll also talk about, Winthrop Center, um, which we won't, University of Toronto, um, which we um, won't. All of these are the largest of their, of their kind and the first of their kind in many cases. So the house um, was the um, largest passive house project in the world when it was built. Sendero will be the largest passive house project period you know, when it's finished, as well as demonstrating that you can do passive house at scale for low income um, folks. <clears throat> Winthrop Center, uh, the largest passive house commercial um, component in the world, and University of Toronto, the largest passive house dormitory in the world. And go next. Um, this is important um, because buildings make up a significant portion of the world's carbon generation. In New York City, buildings generate 70% of carbon emissions. Um, and so cutting them down is critical to our survival as a species and, and, and go next. And we believe it's totally possible by um, paying attention and using technology to do um, um, you know, uh, radically more would radically less. And so we, you know, we know that, you know, so, you know, uh, an LED light bulb uses a quarter of the energy um, of, of a standard incandescent bulb. Go next. A Tesla powered by a cold, a coal, a coal fired or natural gas plant it, um, is a 750% improvement. Um, it uses a quarter of the energy to run than uh, your 1950s car did. And if you go next, and if you hooked up that Tesla um, to a proper infrastructure, you would basically have power for free and no carbon generation and go next. Um, and so passive house buildings generally under, and this is a, a New York standard, um, use around 70% less energy um, than a standard building of equivalent size. And go next. And so uh, Cornell um, was the largest passive house building in the world when it was built. And go next. And it was really a demonstration project to show that it could be done for relatively low premiums um, to standard construction. Um, it was done by following uh, a series of principles outlined here and go next. Um, uh, doing a super efficient um, mechanical system and some innovative um, mega panel technology um, that allowed for larger panels with fewer joints to be installed in, on site and go next. Um, working with contractors to teach them to behave differently. Um, you're basically sealing these up, um, used over seven miles of interior tape in order to get all the joints um, right. After we did this, the, our contractor became the largest passive house contractor in the States. Go next. Um, innovations in how to use standard um, technology in terms of um, incorporating VRF, working with manufacturers um, to right size those units. Go next. Changing the New York City building codes in order to allow us to combine toilet and kitchen exhausts you know, at their termination in order to run them through a heat recovery wheel, which allowed us um, to save over 90% of the energy um, that would have been lost um, by, by dumping that air out and go next. Um, it's the tallest building on the Cornell Tech um, campus and the symbol um, that Passive House can work at scale. It was built for probably a 6% premium over, um, over standard construction. Go next. Views of the project from the main square and go next. The main lounge and entry space and go next. Um, and then the other thing that we're totally focused on is really um, using these buildings to try to create multi-generational mixed income communities, you know, um, and go next. And so we'll talk about Sendero Verde, which is one of the most ambitious projects that we've had the pleasure um, to be um, involved, involved in um, and go next. 
And so this is not just our story, but it's the story of our client, who's a gentleman by the name of Jonathan Rose, who comes from a real estate background and a real estate family, but has decided to uh, dedicate his life really to the idea of creating this idea of a community of opportunity, which is really to um, recognize that low-income families need more than an apartment to change the things that are going on in their lives. You know, it's sort of what USC is trying to do with a lab is basically step outside the, con the conventional definition of a problem and look for real solutions. And so that community of opportunity in Jonathan's mind involves arts and culture, walkability and transit, um, jobs, um, you know, great design, um, local culture, and a whole bunch of other things that really need to be brought together um, in order to create this community of opportunity so that people can thrive in their, you know, in their neighborhoods. And Jonathan has been trying to um, realize this, you know, for the last three, three decades. Um, you know, so he's done some groundbreaking work at, you know, Via Verde. And so sent, you know, uh, with, with uh, Grissom um, and, and partners. Um, and this is the next, the next step and go next. And so this project um, combines um, almost 700 residential units, a health clinic um, from Mount Sinai, um, a YMCA, charter school, union settlement housing, a, a plaza, community gardens, um, and retail um, in three buildings to try to create this community of opportunity. Um, and so this is the original program. Some of the community partners um, have, have changed um, and go next. Um, and it's, again, a project that we worked with the community to establish um, who would live here. And so here you can see an incredibly diverse set of AMIs, everything from 30% AMI um, to 230% um, 200, uh, of AMI and everything in between. Um, relatively a broadband distribution, um, really mirroring um, that which is found in the East Harlem um, community and go next. And then the goal here is to take those programmatic communities which are chosen because of their impact on people's lives. Um, so this will be the largest passive house building um, in the world when it's done. Um, to combine great apartments, you know, um, to combine the idea of both environmental and social justice, um, to invite uh, you know, a charter school that's focused on the academic needs of low-income kids um, you know, with a curricula that's designed to support them and social, and social network to support them, um, to combine that with a YMCA that basically does great nutritional um, counseling, but also um, you know, health and fitness and wellness um, in, you know, in order to introduce people to the idea of exercise size and a healthier lifestyle. But what's also amazing about the YMCA is their donor network and how they actually um, tap their donors to take their kids as interns. So Goldman Sachs is a huge supporter of the YMCA. Um, Goldman takes interns from, from the Y into their summer programs um, so that kids can get a taste of what a different life might look like. Mount Sinai, um, an amazing gentleman by the name of Prabhat Singh, um, who's on the board of Mount Sinai, convinced his board um, that um, it would be less expensive for the institution to set up a community health clinic here rather than having East Harlem residents show up in the emergency room when they didn't know what was going on. Uh, the knock-on benefit of that is that every resident um, will be tested um, for um, lead poisoning, asthma, diabetes, and all of the other things that plague low-end communities. And 40 people from the project you know, um, would be um, trained to do those screenings. Um, a union settlement um, provides social services both for the elderly and for families at risk. Um, you know, and so that basically anyone who gets into trouble you know, basically doesn't have to go far um, to find the programs and the people that can help them through that difficult patch of their life community gardens, you know, farms, demonstration projects, healthy food, and 
then not only for the residents, but then focused you know, out to the larger East Harlem community to really help build Jonathan's community of opportunity. And go next. You know, and so you can see, you know, the ideas of really, uh, you know, a grade really, uh, you know, connectivity into the community um, below grade, you know, that where the, some of the health and fitness areas are, you know, basically connections into all of the buildings. Go next. Um, the um, the um, ramping up, you know, from the corner of 113th, you know, up to, you know, up to that garden central space, which acts as a collective common. Um, go next. And then looking from the Park Avenue um, side up to those um, gardens, Union Settlement on the left. There's a few out parcels, uh, you know, on the site. Um, you can see one on the the left um, side there. You can see the Charter School um, on the right. The goal here, um, um, you know, and these buildings are um, the two lower ones are done, and the uh, tower is rising now. Is to the initial goal was to do these projects for a 0% increase over standard construction. Uh, we failed, um, but we're probably gonna come in between two and 3% you know, higher than um, standard construction um, with the full integration of Passive House. And go next. And views of the, you know, of the common. And that about wraps it up uh, for me. And so, and so that, you know, this project probably more than, and it, you know, there've been failures on it. It's like, it's not gonna be perfectly executed and Jonathan's vision will not be perfectly executed here with the loss of some of the community partners, but it will make a difference. And it, everyone that I have ever talked to about this project and its idea has been inspired and it shows what these projects can do. And so, you know, the lesson that I've learned is that, you know, that this is possible, that each individual building project can be a catalyst for positive urban and social change. And looking at it for not just what it looks like um, and its physical attributes, but for what it can do is a worthwhile exercise. And thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Um, please um, put questions in the Q&A or the chat. Uh, we'd love to have those. Um, so again, thanks for a very um, comprehensive um, talk that, that not only talked about the work, but kind of the context in which the work is happening and, and kind of the innovations you're creating um, for the work itself to, to occur. Um, Maybe I'll start with kind of the notion of the, the city um, as a kind of, as you've stated, as a kind of increment, um, uh, kind of metric to, to kind of evaluate how projects are performing or what their contributions are to a larger polity. Um, I wonder if you could just stress test that with the kind of cities um, that you're working in the most extreme. So I didn't see any projects highlighted in China or India um, or in cities that are, um, you know, slated to go. I was looking at a, a graph or a, um, uh, an image uh, of um, the population of cities kind of that's projected to go in in, uh, in the future. And, and uh, this one all the way sure. to, to Lagos all the way to 88 million. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. So how do you how do you think about kind of um, the kind of you know European and, and American city versus those models, uh, which are just very different kinds of organisms than the cities that you would that that um, you know that New York and LA and stuff? Sure, you know, and 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 they're they're all they're all different, and I think recognizing those differences is the critical thing and approaching them with a certain amount of humility is also you know, important, you know, and, you know, and the challenges are, you know, are different. When we, you know, again, we, like in India, when we talk to folks, they're talking about, you know, you know, doing, a, you know, creating a neighborhood of 50,000 people, you know, like, you know, and designing, you know, like 
four building typologies that would be sort of endlessly repeat. You know, and it's a little bit scary. You know, like and the um, um, the whereas working in Vietnam um, is much more familiar and comfortable. You know, like in terms of the scales are a little bit you know more you know like sort of mid-sized American city. You know, like, and the challenges are you know, while the cities you know lack um, you know certain infrastructure things. You know, like the 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 there's a a, a, a rationality of you know of you know, of of scale. Um, the um, China is all over the place, and in some places, it feels that your addition to those places can you know be productive and you know and make make a difference and you know and and that you're playing this great game of exquisite corpse you know like and you know and your your next your thing you know will actually make a positive contribution and leave the next person with clues on what to do which is kind of the best you can hope for um there um working in abu dhabi is just strange you know like the you know because like the 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 it's um, there isn't a whole there is there isn't a whole lot of a sense of place that has been formed yet, and things are largely you know connected by automobile. You know, it's 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 like LA without the low rise connective tissue. You know, like the which is what's charming about Los Angeles is you know all the strip malls and low rise stuff that connects the pockets of 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 urbanization. So they're all they're all they're all different. Um, the lesson for me and you know is really to try to step back from it and take a deep breath and then just go why are why are we doing this? You know what are you know what's the what's the rationale for it? You know or in some cases of rapid urbanization, how can we make sure that we're doing that we're actually creating an infrastructure that can that that can be grown into, you know, that can it may not be perfect now, but not too much will have to be demolished to make it better. You know, so so it's one of the more hopeful aspects of that is that um, is really about trying to introduce models of sustainability into these places, which um, there's a growing appetite for and a growing sense that it's important pretty much everywhere that we're working. And that the, you know, the critical thing I think is, that, you, know, you know, is from our mission statement, which is really just how can we give everyone a better standard of living without we're doing the least amount of damage to our planet, right? It's, you know, we can't insist, you know, as, you know, as Americans that, you know, Indians are not entitled to, you know, like to, to modify that, you know, to have air conditioning, right? Like it's like that, that like that's, you know, and, and it's, you know, it's not fair to, um, you know, to say that those economies and people, you know, don't deserve a better standard of living. So the question is, how can that be, how can that be done and how can we can contribute to that without doing the most you know without doing you know without doing damage right and so the analysis really starts at home because the you know like we're on a track to you know blow through all of our climate goals and so the only way that we can make room you know for the people in the third world is to radically reduce our own consumption um, so that they can make that they have a little bit more room to use a little bit more energy in order to support a better, a higher standard of living. So that's the part of it that we're kind of mostly focused on in, in every project everywhere is just like, you know, can we design to a net zero standard everywhere? Can we design to a passive house standard, you know, everywhere? Can we make it sexy for our clients? Like the stuff we're doing in Chile is, is so much fun, you know, like the, you know, like the, you know, we're working with some of the best sustainability consultants in the world and, you know, they're not afraid to, to say, yeah, well, what if we just took out the mechanical systems? It's nice outside, you know, like the, you know, what if we just did passive heating and cooling? What if we did solar chimneys? You know, like let's trust the, the sun and the wind, you know, and then 
I have a client who's also a friend of yours that, um, you know, that's willing to take it pretty far. You know, it's Francisco, you know, like the, um, um, you know, and so that's, 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 that's hopeful. What do you, um, I mean, you, you brought up, so I'm going to, I'm going to use it as an example, but, um, that the, the, um, saying that Essex crossing was the anti Hudson Yards. Um, I don't want to get you in trouble with other developers. There, 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 there are clients too. We didn't, <laughs> and we, didn't, we didn't write the article. We just get to show it. So, like, uh, Understood. But understand that even with the best of intentions and with great architects, you can, you can design or you can, uh, the result of a design can be, um, can be deadening for, um, a certain kind of, um, in a certain kind of notion of indigeneity that we expect architects to nuance um, in their work, particularly in cities that, so that, you know, the West side doesn't, in New York, you know, the Upper West side doesn't look like so, and so it doesn't look like the Upper East side, et cetera. Um, and, and so I'm wondering relative to, to just that example of, um, and again, I'm getting the caveat that even with the best intentions, um, space can, can be deadening, um, for a polity based upon the perception of both the, the choices of programming, as well as some of the aesthetic considerations that seem to be ubiquitous around um, projects that, that represent um, luxury and wealth, um, but yet want to have an inviting public space for all classes, right? And so I'm wondering how you um, socialize that conversation within and between uh, your uh, designers and and the clients, and and when you lose that that um, that conversation, is it still a rewarding project for you? So the the answer you know would be that it's if we lose the conversation, it's definitely a less rewarding project for mm -hmm. us you know emotionally and psychologically because it doesn't dovetail with you know with really what's become our mission you know which you know like and so it can still have value but it has less value you know and so the places where we're um usually successful you know are you know that you know, are um where you know the, we're, the idea of really trying to create something authentic you know and and unique you know, i think that that has wide you know um, that you know that doesn't usually get into issues of economics and class where things get a little bit more difficult, you know, like, and it doesn't, and nobody has to imagine that they're going to make less money, you know, like, so, so those are, you know, so trying to create something that is unique to a place, you know, that is authentic, um, that would be worth visiting is usually, is usually easy. Um, the, um, the environmental um, goals are easier and easier to sell, um, you know, and, you know, and, and that, you know, and then as people sort of, um, you know, go up the wealth stream in general, the, you know, their education levels, you know, are sufficient that they actually understand that there is a real problem and that even, and that their investments, you know, basically would be well served by, you know, being environmentally responsible, even if they don't necessarily see any social benefit to doing so, you know, like, so, so those those conversations are usually are usually easy. Um, is it you know easier possible to convince someone who's doing luxury condos to basically put in low income you know HPD for sale units as well? No, um, you know like you know they but that's that's where public policy comes in, right? So that's really where you know the series of carrots and sticks. You know, so if you remember one of my other statements, which is really you know, um, you know, it's basically intelligent public policy harnessing enlightened self-interest. So that's really where the policy thing, you know, comes in. And so that's, and so one of the things that's great about where we're at now is that we have those conversations with planners and politicians and, you know, and stuff like that, because they come to our groundbreaking and openings and they talk about how we do stuff like this. And then, you know, and then, so if you can, you know, create the proper carrots and sticks so that people will in, you know, like we'll do the right thing, um, it becomes the way that people do things. So in, in New York City now, because of all of the policy things that have actually been going on for the last 30 or 40 years, it's uneconomical to build rental housing um, without incorporating some low-income housing. 
because of the you know combination of tax credits, low income low income bonds, zoning incentives. There's a whole um, you know series of things that have been created um, that make it uneconomic to not provide low income housing. So that's where you know, and so those things have evolved over you know over the last 20, 30, 40 years um, um, to create an ecosystem of policy and developers <clears throat> in, New, in New York, um, you know, where low-income housing routinely gets created. Um, and no New Yorker minds living in a rental apartment building with low-income folks in it. Right. Ne you know, I've never heard an issue or a complaint. And when I started, you know, in you know, you're doing you know, you're doing low income housing and mixed income housing, people would try to shield the market rate rental, you know, tenants from the, and not give them access to the amenities and give them less quality finishes and stuff like that. That's almost all gone away, right? You know, because you know, and mostly because um, people didn't see the need to do it anymore. The, re you know, the reactions were, you know, from folks who live there were positive. You know, there was no, there was no issue, no, no, you know, no problem. And, you know, the folks that approved projects were, became a little bit more diligent about just going, you know, it's really not right. You know, you should, you should do the right thing, you know? And so it's evolved in a, an amazingly natural and, and, you know, way. And there are developers whose main business is making mixed income and low income, you know, housing and they do a great job of it, you know, and so, so it really is, you know, focusing on the policy aspects. And so one of the things that I love to do is like, like, you know, like is talk to mayors, you know, like in planning directors in cities that we go to and go, are you using your full share of low income tax credits from the federal government? You know, are you, you know, like, you know, do you have an ecosystem in place, you know, to house your folks? You know, like, do you, you know, like, cause most cities don't, um, LA doesn't really starting to develop, but it doesn't really have the same kind of infrastructure that New York has. There's a question uh, from Elena Curry Carter. An amazing example. This is an amazing example of how to create multifunctional communities with a variety of services. How are residents selected? Has there been any resistance or difficulties with the mixed income residences? Do people accept the differences and form a strong community bond? Kind of what to what you're saying. Yeah, so so the the answer is yeah, it seems the evidence is that is that they do and there isn't any there really isn't any resistance, you know, and then you know the whole idea, you know, so the residential buildings are are you know, especially the you know, all of them really, you know, from low income to mixed income, you know, to market rate, they're they're more highly amenitized. And the amenities are really um, developers see these amenities as not just ways to attract tenants, but to actually build communities within their building, you know, and so that's where you're likely to meet your fellow residents, you know, like working out at the, you know, at the gym, hearing a lecture, you know, like going to, you know, down to, you know, having somebody from the bike shop come in and show you how to tune up your bike, you know, you're likely to meet folks, you're not going to know how much they make, you know, like the, you know, like the, um, the, you know, and so it, you, you, you know, and you might just make a friend. Um, the, um, for the, the, the selection of tenants for the low income units is, um, is highly regulated um, to make sure that it's a fair and equitable process. Um, you know, and that, you know, and that, you know, and so the, the developers do not have the right to sort of uniformly screen, you know, their tenants and basically put in, you know, like you know, the folks that they want, you know, in the buildings is usually done with the assistance of community-based organizations. Um, Essex had the most unique process, you know, which I mentioned, which is um, the outreach um, to families that had been displaced um, by the original slum clearance programs, which was miraculous. It was brilliant, you know, like, and, you know, and, um, um, and you know, so it really makes that an act of of rep of of healing, you know, and 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 urban reparation, you know, to basically not only do something nice now, but to um, heal an emotional scar, you know, that basically existed in the neighborhood for nearly fifty years. So that that was that was awe inspiring. It's like one of those things we just go. That, that you developed with the community exchange, or was it something that was politically put in place? It was a conversation between you know 
the you know the the city the community boards the developer and us you know just like wouldn't it be amazing if we could you know bring folks back and then you know i, I you know and so i probably participated in 70 community board hearings it was crazy you know like you know when people would come back and just go and, be, and just say that you know I, you know I, I left the neighborhood you know so like a, a you know 50 year old guy would say i you know like my family was kicked out of the neighborhood when i was four I, you know i lost my best friend you know like and then how do i come how do i come back you know like and you know like and and so it was it you know again it was sort of, you know it's in you know the reverse of gentrification right you know like the you know it's the, like like bringing folks home um so that was that was nice you know like and so that that and the sendero verde story are two of the narratives that are most powerful to me jonathan's struggle you know to give people more than a home to help change their lives you know like and then you know and what the city you know again I, and so, so milton to you know to be fair let's give the credit to the city for that you know for that bring, that bringing back you know the fact that a, a bureaucracy would embrace that you know and all the complexities you know within that you know is is brilliant and you know and staggering and 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 praiseworthy right so like great i'm wondering if um just to change a little pivot a little bit to some of the technological innovations that you discussed that are happening within your firm. Um, thinking about Gary Technologies and um, you know the ability to kind of monetize architectural innovation, is that something that you're actively doing with these entities within your firm, these subdisciplinary areas where there's no we we no? give it away we we <laughs> give it away we're 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 Linux. We're open source, you know. Like, and so we're actually part of um, um, on the digital. So on the so you know, like, and then this is like a little bit out of school, you know, as well. But we already put up the anti Hudson Yard slide. You know, like I don't enjoy you know giving huge piles of money to Autodesk every 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 year and having them control my production. So, you know, so you know, um, you know, so we've done joint ventures with Katia to help bring them into the you know more into the architectural space um we have uh relationships with um shop tt core you know uh, other you know other sort of big firms that are working on on innovation to you know to basically share there's two conventions a year where we we do papers for right and, and other people do we pretty much share everything that we you know that we you know that we make um the again like the that we're we're doing like again like i have enough to eat you know like the you know like and um and i enjoy our collaborations you know with all of these these folks you know like and um it's i'd rather be and again it's sort of like why i became an architect you know like as you know like they like you do a building you know and you you and it's out there and you want it to be positively received and then you move on to the next one and you don't want to make the same one over and over again right you know like you want to find you know that one's done you move on to the next thing if people copy you you know like and what you did you know it's not stealing your ideas it was just there they were good ideas you know like so people just go yeah that makes sense you know like the you know it's like the you know i'm, I'm flattered every time i see you know something that i put into the world adopted by somebody else uh, um, and, it, and i trust you know that that our team will be creative enough to come up with something even more interesting the next time. So let me ask you about kind of something that that also um, cuts across, um, you know, cities like New York and other mega cities, which is um, the uh, proliferation of super tall buildings. And um, I'm wondering, um, relative to the types of work that you showed and the scale. Um, within within the within the cities that you that you are working, um, when is too when is tall too tall? When does it begin to rob the street of a kind of vibrancy? And when when should we, you know, expand outward as opposed to upward? In the, you know, to save um, certain notions of the city, maybe they're antiquated notions of the city and street life, but nevertheless, um, to use that as a kind yeah. of metric, um, uh, how do you how do you view that? I don't, you know, and so, so this, so, 
Bill, I very rarely disagree with you, but like I do, like, and so, but I'm not sure that I think the premise might be uh, might be flawed. You know, I think it's perfectly possible to land a super tall in a pedestrian friendly way on the street. The Empire State Building does a really good job, right? You know, like the you know of of you know of, of hitting the Chrysler Building does a really does a does a really good job. There's modern examples that do that do a really good job. You you have to pay attention to what you know, to how big people are, you know, like, and, you know, like, and there are these various scales of perception, you know, like, so that, you know, that, you know, that, you know, the first 12 feet are the most important, you know, and then somewhere between 60 and 85 feet on a normal, you know, 15 to 20 foot wide sidewalk. That's the zone that people are going to experience, you know, and having form breaks, you know, at those places, you know, like basically you can easily, you know, in my opinion, you know, go, you know, um, you know, 80 or 90 stories, you know, um, for that. Should you do that on a side street on, you know, in the Upper East Side? No, you know, like the, you know, like the, um, the, um, is that a great addition to the skyline on Central Park South? No, you know, like, but that's the, you know, the, the buildings are, are, mediocre and you know and not worthy of of that jewel that's you know that they're that they're fronting on could it have been better yep um you know like christian de and park you know is a friend of mine that building that he did you know on 57th street is hideous you know like the you know you know like so you know he's he's a really good architect you know like and the um so the crop of those buildings i think is poisoning the argument um and um and i think you know bunches of us know better you know and you know and there are ways where those things can be successfully integrated into you know more tr traditional notions of urban of urban fabric and how you know what the pedestrian realm should you know should be um <clears throat> i love streets you know like the you know like i love tall buildings too you know like and the you know and so you know, and my, um, and your fellow friend and, you know, and, and compatriot, you know, Mr. Middleton is a genius at sort of managing those kind of interactions, you know, like, and, you know, and would never, ever, you know, like basically compromise one for the, you know, for the other. We have a new building going up in Boston that, you know, it's going to be a pretty good demonstration of some of that, you know, some of that stuff. Um, so I think it's just, um, you know, some badly conceived projects, some of which were done by good architects, <clears throat> but not, not an essential um, outcome of the problem statement. Maybe the last um, set of questions would be around um, uh, some of the, the landscape interventions um, and also memorials that, that you've done. Uh, maybe some of the pro bono work as well in terms of um, maybe to start with the um, the High Line has been hugely successful. Um, some would say profitable. Um, I wonder, you know, in, in Los Angeles here, we have the Los Angeles River Basin, which is um, I think 55 miles or I mean, it's cutting across um, multiple um, uh, 20 or, or 20 plus municipalities. Um, it's a very different animal than, than the High Line, and obviously other cities have emulated the High Line in terms of the ethos of, of that kind of promenade through the city. I'm wondering what you learned from that, that, or what we should learn or take from that in terms of developing other kinds of, of public infrastructure um, that, that has potentially huge benefits for um, increasing park space, open space, and access to the city from, um, from multiple constituencies. So one of the things you know that we did at the Highline was really create the Highline Institute, um, which was you know, a way to partner with other um, you know um, communities and organizations that were looking to do similar things, right? And so the every every year the you know the Highline basically does a number of these partnerships, and the the the. And amongst the critical attribute for selecting those partners really is that they're community-based. Um, you know that the, you know um, um, that they have um, a strong idea. You know, um, and they have a good you know sort of nucleus of folks you know who are thinking clearly of connections you know or the ability to forge connections you know into government and their you know and their communities. And then they're brought in 
um, to meet with both each other, you know, and the Highline staff and planning staff um, in order to hone their projects, you know, and so it's, it's amazing, right? You know, it's, and it's, you know, it's, a, it's a model of what, how a nonprofit should share, right? You know, like, and, you know, you know, it's, it's success. Um, the, um, Highline itself, you know, has sort of re-examined, you know, its notions of success, you know, and, you know, and so the two founders were community organizers and basically found themselves embraced by the development community, you know, had an enormously successful project that was, you know, used, you know, as a tool by, you know, a lot of real estate, you know, um, developers, um, and has basically returned their focus to the local community, which involves a tremendous number of um, low-income residents, you know, you know, at some of the housing projects that front onto the project, uh, giving, bringing that community um, onto the High Line and making them realize that it's their closest public open space. Um, train, you know, basically creating internships for their kids. Um, bringing their culture up onto the High Line to share with the larger community of New Yorkers and folks from, from around the world, you know, and so to basically um, correct, you know, some of the mistakes we made, you know, in, in our glory period of sort of maybe ignoring um, some of the folks that were closest to us, you know, and so acknowledging that and recognizing that, you know, is always, is always, is, is, is always important um, some of these projects that are going on around the country are, are you know, again, it's, 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 it really does feel like a, like a blossoming, right? You know, where, you know, where, where, you know, where these ideas can really um, take off. I think the, you know, the, you know, the Los Angeles water you know, basin, having a place where you could ride a bike, you know, like for 40 miles, you know, like, you know, like without having to, you know, that would be amazing, you know, to have that kind of a, uh, of a you know to turn that space over to pedestrians and you know, you know to create that kind of arterial would be an amazing step for you know for Los Angeles and change people's perception of you know of what that city you know what your city is capable of right you know like the um, so so yes those projects are 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 amazing you know like and and the invest those kind of investments in human infrastructure, human centered infrastructure um, are critical to our sanity, you know, and to our, you know, survivability, you know, as, you know, as a, you know, as a species, right? You know, it's really continuing the work of Frederick Law Olmsted, right? The cities need to be ventilated and opened up. But also the recognition that um, in this in this COVID or post-COVID, not sure we're still in COVID uh, world, uh, the importance of um, analyzing wellness uh, across multiple constituencies and communities, and, and part of part of doing that is uh, taking care of the some of the impediments to, to wellness, which have been in some of these communities, environmental um, racism and um, Poor air quality, uh, and then and then you move towards poor or little access to uh, open space, shaded areas, et cetera. And so, excuse me, climate, um, quality of life, wellness are, are kind of coming together in very interesting ways. Yeah, one of the other things we've been talking about with some of our clients, some of whom have been more receptive than others, is really um, just as part of the amenity and infrastructure of some of these larger projects, can you actually form relationships with um, local farmers, um, you know, and can you actually do things where you actually do, you know, like, re, you know, reinvent the Chinese idea of really bringing it, bringing out night soil from the city to the, you know, to the country and then bringing back food, you know, like, and so to really restore the links between urban and rural communities in a way which could be amazingly helpful, helpful for people, um, but also just to break down some of the political divides that basically separate urban and rural communities. So to have, you know, like to really create spaces where, you know, like, again, why wouldn't you offer, you know, like a, you know, a CSA, you know, like within your building, you know, where, you know, a farmer could show up, you know, you know, on a weekly basis with a, you know, with a box of, of vegetables, you know, you could know that person, right. And you're 
compost that you're you know that you're basically storing is going out to their farm in the back of their electric pickup you know like when they're driving you know when they're driving home so we started to have those kind of conversations you know like we're looking for you know the sort of you know again a sort of landmark you know demonstration project you know like where we could you know sort of do it at scale you know like to um, so that you know, it's the, like it's those those are the kinds of things that are kind of fun to think about and look for those opportunities and that we're kind of privileged to um, to find you know you know more often than maybe we deserve you know like that. Thank you, Gary. Um, we'll let you get get to sleep, but um, we appreciate uh, you know the the. The depth of the work that you're doing, and uh, also the um, the work that you're doing in the, in the nonprofit and pro bono world, and and I think the redefining kind of what or defining kind of what architecture and what architects um, can do, both relative to technology, community, environment, et cetera. So it's really great. We're sorry that you're not here in person, but um, like we do with each lecture during this period, we're going to at some point. Um, be available soon, I believe, to have people in person. We'll have to have you back to interact with our students and faculty. It'd be great. That would be a pleasure. And thank you, everyone who joined. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Have Take care. Thanks, everybody. Take care.